It's, it's such a tremendous honor and blessing to be able to, to be asked and to be trusted to come up and, and represent the word of the Lord. And it's not something I take lightly. And uh, I just I want to represent the king well. And um, so today, and I, I don't know if we got the, the slides up, I'm, I'm kind of continuing on with this theme of who do you say that I am? And, um, and when Matthew asked me about doing this a few weeks ago, the first thing that came to my mind was, was Isaiah. And I was like, that's, that's a pretty big uh, area of Scripture to, to discuss, 66 books. And uh, so I, I went through it probably four times over the past few weeks. And uh, what is it that, that we want to do? So what I'm representing to you today, there's two big concepts, and, uh, and hopefully it'll, it'll speak to you. And uh, so I want to set this up. Um, again, it's taking a closer look at the suffering servant, starting in Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. And so we're actually going to do kind of a study here today. And I'm going to show you some linkages and, and, and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be blessed. And uh, so on the second slide, I just want to set this up because of uh, what John, one of the disciples of Yeshua, he had said, for this is the love of Yah that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. And a lot of people would agree with that statement that actually would deny him, right? Because those commandments are important. They show that we are in covenant with our great king. And also John says, now we know that this, by that we know him if we uh, keep his commandments, for he says, I know him and does not keep him. He's a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, the love of Yah is perfected in him. And by this, we know that we are in him. He who abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. So we're supposed to be imitators of the Messiah who walked according to the Torah and the prophets and the precepts, because frankly, he was the one that inspired it in the beginning. But these are things that that John said that that folks that that actually deny Yeshua would agree with. But the next slide I kind of wanted to point out in, in uh, slide three is this Antichrist spirit where they would agree with John in this. But let me show you what else John has to say. He says, little children, it's the last hour. And you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. And he also says, who is a liar but he that denies that Yeshua is the Messiah? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. And he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And so we see that there's this spirit of Antichrist that's been kind of on the move since the days of the quote-unquote early church, the early believers, the follower of Yeshua, right? And there's anti-missionaries that are out there today that are specifically trained to methodically erode our confidence in our scripture and the Messiah. They, 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 they want to challenge the validity of the New Testament and, and they want to undermine our trust in Yeshua the Messiah, the one who is the soon coming king over all the earth. And so what I want to do today, and then the next slide shows you the goal that I want to help strengthen your faith. OK, we want to take a look at Isaiah in his description of the suffering servant in a little bit more detail. We want to look at the context of, of what's going on in this particular passage. We want to know who's, who's actually doing the talking. Who are they talking to? Who are they talking about? And what are they actually saying? And we want to show how there's accurate fulfillment of these messianic prophecies hundreds of years, hundreds of years proclaimed before they actually happened. And we want to contextualize the Jewish argument of the prophecies concerning this one in particular, where it says that it relates to the nation of Israel as opposed to the suffering servant, the Messiah himself. And so we're, we're going to show you in the language how it's impossible. And then we're going to show the key purposes of Yeshua's ministry. And so if you want to dive in, let's start with who is Isaiah? Because why would we want to talk about this prophet? Okay, in Isaiah 1.1, it says that the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Yehuda and Yerushalayim in the days of Uzziah, Yotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. And so what we see here is Isaiah is actually the first of the prophets that was, had a message specifically targeted to Judah or the southern kingdom. And earlier prophets like Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, Elisha, and Jonah, actually, they dealt primarily with northern kingdom or the kingdom of Israel's sin patterns and their issues, right? So Isaiah is the first one to really get in there and start dealing with the southern kingdom or Judah. 
And so Jewish tradition in the Talmud actually records that Isaiah, uh, Isaiah offended King Manasseh, who was, Isaiah died during the, the time of King Manasseh, and he was the, the king of Judah. And, is, and there's two documents, or two sightings in the Talmud in the Jewish sources that, that basically say Isaiah was hiding out in a cedar tree. And because he had uttered, why would you pick me? I'm a man of unclean lips and I'm with a people of, you know, un, who have unclean lips. And that offended Manasseh so much that he actually cut the tree in half, according to the Jewish tradition, that Isaiah was hiding out in. And it says that once the saw hit his lips... And he was now cut off for claiming that we have unclean lips. Then the prophet died. So there's a strong hostility traditionally against uh, what Isaiah had to say. But nevertheless, if what he says came true, we don't have to like it. Kings a lot of times don't like what prophets have to say because there's a great king who's above them. And a lot of times they don't like that. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I want to help strengthen your faith today. And, and let's talk a little bit more about Isaiah. Who were his contemporaries? Because I'm trying to put him in context so you see how he fits in. And see, so when I say contemporary, I mean, who were the people that were alive? What, who, what was his environment? And there was Isaiah's prophecy ministry. There was actually these kings of Israel, the northern kingdom, because the kingdom had been divided and split at this point. And it was under Jeroboam II, Zechariah, Menachem, Pekah. Pekiah and Pekah and Hosea are the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel. There was also four other prophets that were active during the time of the life of Isaiah. The prophet Amos, Hosea, and Micah. And Amos also had a lot to say uh, to and for and about Judah, and they were kind of contemporaries working together. Now, again, in the southern kingdom, uh, it was Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were the kings that were there during the time. And, and actually, several of them had pretty good track records as kings. And the major pagan power that was, uh, that was up and running was actually the kingdom of Assyria. And this kingdom ruled from 900 B.C. to 612 B.C. when they were overtaken by uh, the Babylonians. And so what we see is Assyria had exiled the northern kingdom in 722 BC. And so all of the, the reason I'm telling you all this background is the prophet Isaiah, if you want to kind of get an average, everything he was saying was about 700 years before the life of Yeshua the Messiah. 700 years. So we're going to talk, tell you, we're going to cover some really cool stuff. Now, there's a DVD out there that you, many of you probably have seen it. It's really interesting. It's called The Star of Bethlehem. And Rick Larson was a, an attorney that really started investigating. He got a hold of some software and he looked at he was looking for the Star of Bethlehem. And he had some really interesting observations that essentially identify the triple conjunction of Jupiter, Venus and Regulus, which is the brightest star in the constellation called Leo. Right. Which it, Regal is where you the Regal is the king star in Leo, the lion the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, right? He is the one that is, is uh, kind of ruling the heavens, so to speak, right? And I'm not talking about worshiping the stars. I'm just saying that the Lord uses the heavens to declare His majesty, right? And so what He basically did was, uh, it was a strange thing because at the same time you have this triple conjunction occurring. What you also have is a new moon crescent that occurred on September 10th. So if the crescent is seen on September 10th, then that makes the Rosh Chodesh 9-11, <laughs> Interesting, that date. And it was the year 3 BC, and that was the sign that the wise men from the east, that's when they saw that sign, and they knew that the king was here, and they came to worship the king, and they brought frankincense, gold, and myrrh. And I believe they got their information from Daniel. But that sets around 3 BC, again, 700 years after these prophecies that uh, Isaiah gave as to when the Messiah was, was born. Now, we also see, and I did a teaching about in May, uh, Heart Like Daniel, where I talked about the Daniel 77's prophecies, and there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens, and the Messiah, the prince, will be cut off after the 62. And we arrived at 30 AD, when there was that Wednesday Passover, <laughs> was about the time that Yeshua would have been uh, put to death, according to the prophet Daniel, along with information from uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, 
with those markings and we looked at some, some natural history information to kind of help us identify what these dates were. So again, Isaiah is speaking long before these events. Now the next slide, I went through and identified as many of the prophecies concerning the Messiah from the book of Isaiah that I could find. And I listed them all out here and you can't read them. But I organized them in a way that I will tell you a story. And every sentence that I'm going to say is backed up by a chapter and verse reference from the book of Isaiah. And if you want to look into this further, I can show you where in the New Testament all of these are referenced. But I couldn't fit all of that on one slide. But I just want to, I want to let you hear the testimony of Isaiah from his entire 66 chapter book writing. And, and in summary, what he says is a child is going to be born and he will rule as Elohim. And that's from chapter 9, verse 6. And I won't say all the chapter verse references. You can see it uh, later. His, he will be called Emmanuel, which is Elohim or God with us. He will be a son who is given to us and the government will eventually rest on his shoulders. He'll be born in the king as king in the line of David. And he will be a rod from the stem of Jesse. He will be born of a virgin. Sounds kind of crazy, but it's pretty miraculous to have a virgin give birth. There's a lot of young women that give birth and it's not such a miracle. It would be like he, the Messiah came and drank fresh water from a jar. Okay, we, most of us probably have drank fresh water from a jar. Most of us were probably born of a woman. Most of our mothers may have been young when they had us. But the fact that she was a virgin is what made it noteworthy as a prophecy. And Matthew has an awesome teaching on the closed men and a lot of mystical understandings that we are, in fact, talking about a virgin. But he will, be call, he will call out to foreign nations, and those nations are the Gentiles. And when he does actually call them out, the people's hearts are hardened. And he's supposed to be the stone in Zion, a sure foundation. But he will be a stumbling stone to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. His role is to ratify the covenant, the new covenant with Israel and Judah and to be a light to the nations or the Gentiles. And someone will come and prepare the way for his coming. And the spirit of Yahweh will rest on him and he will be a good shepherd and a good leader of his people and he will be a servant of Elohim. His ministry will be in Zebulun, Naphtali and Galilee all throughout the region of the land of Israel. He will be a healer and a savior and do many miracles He'll even heal the deaf and restore sight to the blind. And rabbinic texts say that only the Messiah could do that. There's no, there's no recording in the Old Testament of anybody ever giving sight to someone born blind. And they say that because the prophet said, open our eyes that we could see the wondrous things that you've hidden in your Torah for us. The only one who can open our eyes is the Messiah. Yeshua healed the blind. He was anointed to preach liberty to the captives. We were just singing about that, setting the captives free, right? <laughs> and he did this very thing. The nations and the Gentiles will walk in the light of Yahweh, and his law is the light, his Torah is the light. But he will be beaten and spat upon. He will be accused and afflicted, but silent in response. He'll be mistreated, beaten nearly beyond recognition. He, but this is the process that he goes through to bear our sorrow and our grief. He's wounded for our transgressions, not his own because he was sinless without guile. He will be a perfect Passover lamb with life-saving blood. And he will also be led as a lamb to the slaughter and made to be a guilt offering. He'll be numbered with the transgressors when he's, when he's dead, but he'll be buried with the rich. And that promised Redeemer from Zion now makes intercession for the transgressors and a way of repentance for the nations. He's the light shining through the darkness. He's full of wisdom, power, and righteousness. And when He returns, He has the key to the house of David. And He is Yahweh's elect servant in whom He delights. This is all from Isaiah. Now that tells a powerful story 700 years before Yeshua of Nazareth came. And so, is it worth looking into? We'll focus in on the suffering servant. So what, again, our core text for today is we're going to take a look at all the verses, Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. And there's 15 verses, 
And we're going to explain an interesting is as to why there's 15. It's three groups of five. I'm sorry, five groups of three. And, uh, and we're going to establish who is talking to whom about what and who and why and what is the outcome. And so why the 15? This is slide nine. And so when, I, when I'm looking for numbers and looking for patterns in Scripture, you look at the Hebrew alphabet, there, there are no numbers, but the numbers and the letters are the same because really the numbers are the letters. And so just do simple math. 15, well, the, the, if you just look at the alphabet, the two least common denominators to make up that is the number 10 and the number 5. And the number 10 is the Yod. The number 5 is He. And that speaks of Yah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So these 15 verses are actually talking about the Lord. But what does it actually mean? The Yod is your hand or your arm. And the He is to reveal or to show. And so the arm of Yahweh is revealed. And so Isaiah says in Isaiah 53 verse 1, Who has relieved our report and to whom has the arm of Yah been revealed. <laughs> it's through these 15 verses that he's showing you who the arm of Yahweh is. So a little fun with Hebrew stuff, right? So in the first group here in the suffering servant, so what we'll do is we're going to read some of these ver the verses and then we're going to talk about questions, issues, and observations associated with these verses, right? And he says, behold, my servant shall deal prudently and he shall be exalted, extolled, and very high. All right, so before we get into it too much, whose servant is he? He's Yah. He's a servant of Yah, right? Isaiah 52.3, the context of who's doing the talking, he says, for thus is Yahweh. See, Yahweh is, is establishing that Yahweh is doing the talking, okay? But who has been wise, exalted, and lifted very high? Now, I will propose to you that is Yeshua. First of all, his wisdom, let's talk about that, right? In Luke 2, verses 46 and 47, Yeshua's parents had come up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Passover, and they kind of lost track of him. And I don't know how, but they were on their way back home, and they realized, hey, somebody forgot Yeshua. Where is he? He was a young fellow at that point. I think he was about 12 or 13. He might have been just bar mitzvahed, as far as we know. Um, but nevertheless, it says here that now, it was after three days that they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard of him, heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So he was full of wisdom. He, people were amazed about his understanding. Now, when it says he's exalted and high and lifted up, this has double meaning. First of all, our calendar, what year are we in on the Gregorian calendar right now? 2021, right? It's... They've changed it to B, B, C, E, or, you know, after the death is C, E, common era. Well, what's common? The Messiah. <laughs> when he came, he's what made everything in common because he is, the nations understood. And so that's why we have B, C, before Christ and A, D, after his death. He's, he, even in the way we discuss the pagan calendars, it still acknowledges the coming of the Messiah. Now, it says that he was lifted up and, and high and lifted up, right? And so we exalt him. We've been praising him. We've been excited about him all day today. But I'll suggest to you that when he paid the price, he was exalted in a, a different way. He was lifted up on that cross. He was high and lifted up. And this lamb who was dead, but yet where is his heel when he's lifted up? It's in the air. Well, the enemy is called the power of the prince of the air, and his heel was crushing the head, <laughs> even though he was dead. You see, so mystically speaking, Yeshua in his death actually was lifted up and crushed the power of the prince of the air. Okay, and so he was lifted very high. Now, one of the, one of the Jewish arguments is that this whole thing is talking about the nation of Israel. And I agree in this first part of this passage in verse 14, it is talking about the nation of Israel and Judah, right? Just as many were astonished at you. That's the part. <laughs> He's talking about you, Judah, and Israel. And so we go back to, well, how do we know this? Because in a previous chapter in Isaiah, verse 52, 4, he says, For thus says Adonai Yahweh, my people went down to Egypt to dwell there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. 
and people oppress them still, and they blaspheme his name. So what, when, the, when the people of Israel, which includes Israel and Judah at the time, you know, they were oppressed. The, the Egyptians were beating them. I mean, when Moses saw this happen, he actually killed one of them, right? And so, so when the, he says here, as many were astonished at you, the Egyptians really didn't have a very high regard for the children of Israel. But even to that extent that they were astonished at you, when they see him, he was beaten beyond recognition. He was beyond the, more than the sons of men. So as bad as it was on you in Egypt, it was worse on him. So you see how the language delineates between the nation and the one who's... So the nation can't be the one who was marred beyond because they, their reference point was how difficult it was back in Egypt. And so this servant... When Yeshua was tried and he was beaten and he was hung on the cross and mocked and they put this robe on him and they started saying, oh, prophesy now, who just punched you? You know, it's, it, he was far worse than any of our ancestors were when they were in Egypt. And it says here that this servant will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths at him. So let's talk about this sprinkling for a second. I believe there's two references in the Torah that talk about sprinkling. And this describes an essential function of the servant that Isaiah is talking about. And if you look at Exodus chapter 24, verses 5 through 8, it is, it's talking about Moses. And he says, He sent the young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings. And it says, of oxen. Okay, so an oxen is a bull or a pear in Hebrew. Right. And they take these peace offerings and the burnt offerings. Uh, they were sacrificed to Yahweh. And it says Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, put half the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that Yahweh has said, we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. And he says, this is the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has made with you according to all these words. So you see the blood of this bull was used to ratify the covenant, to establish the covenant once the people had it in their heart. We'll just do whatever he says. We don't even know what he's going to tell us yet, but our attitude is we'll obey. So we're, we're in. And Moses sprinkled the people with the blood. But Isaiah is talking about a servant sprinkling the people. <laughs> well, Leviticus 19 ta also talks about another bovine, a, a, a bull or a cow. It's the red heifer, the uh, para adama. And when we read this whole section about this red heifer, we see that this female cow who is perfectly red was sent outside the camp and slaughtered, right? The whole thing was burnt up and, but before they burned it, they had to put cedar, hyssop, and scarlet in it. And then they light it on fire, and they get these ashes. And then once they take those ashes, then they can then cleanse the people. And especially what, what was unique with this red heifer was that this cleansing, this sprinkling, was to help them overcome corpse contamination. It is the only remedy for if you come in touch with the death of a human. But yet we see that he, the servant, will sprinkle many nations. And that's why when we say we come under the blood of Yeshua, his blood is the one that does even more than cleanse us from contamination of death. It does more than just say, hey, it's a covenant. He is establishing and ratifying the new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah by his blood. Now, what's really interesting is, again, how that all works out. He's showing us that it's his blood he sprinkles, we're in covenant. Without that blood, we have no covenant. Without that blood, we have no purification from death. You see how the pattern was established in the Torah? The prophet speaks about it, and it's telling us of the sacrifice of Yeshua the Messiah. 700 years before it happened. And in Moses' case, it was like 1,500 years before it happened. Okay? So now it says that, and because of all of this, kings will shut their mouths at him. What kings are we talking about? If you read Psalm chapter 2, it says that the kings of the earth have plotted a vain thing. They've conspired against Yahweh and His Mashiach. It says they're conspiring against the Messiah. And it says that, that 
the Lord looks at them and laughs. He's laughing. He's like, are you serious? You think you're coming against my son? <laughs> Do you know what he did? He says, and then his anger flurries up on them and his nostrils give them a blast. It's like he sneezes on them. It's like they're more scared of that than COVID. Right? And they're like, oh, shut my mouth. Put a mask on. You know, it's like he shuts their mouth because what can they say to the king of kings except hallelujah? And, and why? Because he did all of these things. This was the plan of the Lord. And for what they had not been told, they'll see it because they don't want to hear the word of the Lord, but they're going to see it one day. And what they've not heard, they'll consider it because they'll have no choice. They'll be confronted when he returns. And so that's group one. <laughs> group two, the next three verses. Again, who has believed or reported to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? We've just talked about the arm of Yahweh just a second ago, right? But check out Isaiah 52.10, and I'm gonna go to, we'll go to the next slide, and I kind of have this in Hebrew. And it says, Yahweh has made bare His holy arm in the eyes of the nations, and the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our Elohim. Now, one more slide. I've circled some key things. His arm is revealed to the Gentiles. <laughs> and this is a vexing thing. It's like His own people... It's like they don't see it, but the Gentiles are, it's like easier for the Gentiles to accept it. But the prophet says that Yahweh is going to show his arm. He's going to roll up his sleeve and show his arm. And who is the arm? If you see here, this one that I have circled on the left, it says the Aleph Tav et Zeroah Kodesh. His holy arm is the Aleph Tav. The first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. <laughs> The one who is dead and yet lives and now lives forevermore. And he says that he'll be seen, call Hagoyim, all of the nations. All of the nations will know that he is the arm. And who is the Aleph Tav? Yeshua? This is salvation. He says that the ends of the earth, the salvation of our Elohim. The salvation of our Elohim is the word Yeshua. The prophet is saying that Yeshua is the Aleph Tav and he is the salvation for the whole earth. Again, 700 years before he comes. So when people say there's no talk of the Messiah, it's, all, it's, got, it's got him right here, Yeshua. And so he is made bare in the sight of the Goyim. They know him. They are, he has exposed himself to them. Yeshua is our salvation. So continuing on with the second group, it says, for he will grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Now this root, you, if you've done any Hebrew studies, there's a word called the shoresh. The shoresh is what is the root of a word, right? And, and so it, it helps you kind of look at the language because where does this particular word come from? What is its root? Well, it literally also means the root of a plant. And what I'm submitting to you is this shoresh is the word that is in this particular verse. It's also relating to another shoresh from Isaiah 11, verse 1, where it talks about the branch. Well, there's five prophecies concerning this Messiah figure that's called the branch. And this Hebrew word for branch is netzer. So on the next Verse, I have this uh, Isaiah 11, and you see, he will come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch, and it says, out of his roots are, uh, it's uh, Mishara uh, Shaw. So sh you have this, this idea of this root. But the word that is connected to is Netzer. And so I want to point out in Matthew 23. Now, the prophecy says that the, that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Right, the house of bread, Beit Lechem, right? But this prophecy that Matthew's talking about, it says after the death of Herod, you know, when they were in Egypt, Joseph, you, you know, Joseph and Miriam were given the message, hey, Herod's dead, you can come home now. Because remember, the proclamation had gone out to kill all the baby boys, just like from the days of Moses, when the Egyptians were like, we better wipe them out, so let's start killing all the baby boys, because well, our kingdom needs to remain. We need to remain strong. Well, Herod had the same mindset as Pharaoh. And he ordered all the boys under age two killed, right? But, but at this point, Herod had died. And so now Joseph and Mary knew they could bring their family back. And it says that in Matthew 2, 23, that he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. 
that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet, say he shall be called a Nazarene. So let me ask you, where in the prophets does it say he's going to be called a Nazarene? The city, Nazareth, didn't actually exist. But it's speaking of the branch, the Netzer, because Nazareth, the way you say it in Hebrew is Netzeret, Netzer et. He's the branch. So the prophecy that the branch would come forth, see, he went to live in Nazareth. Well, where is Nazareth in relation to Jerusalem? It's kind of out a little bit. And remember, the, again, when Herod issued the proclamation to kill the baby boys, Yeshua, his family was warned to go down to Egypt, get out of there. And we see John the Baptist was his cousin. Well, where did John the Baptist, where was he hanging out? In a river, <laughs> eating you know, locusts and honey and having camp. He was, a, he was a prophet who was in hiding. He was like out of the way for Herod uh, to come down and kill the boys. His parents took him out and said, we'd rather live in the wilderness safely than be under the threat of this king. So the Lord preserved John the Baptist and Yeshua the Messiah. But when Yeshua came back, he lived in Nazareth because that's why he's the branch. He's the one who is the branch who lived in the city that's called the branch. And the reason that it's called a branch is because when Herod went to cut off the firstborn, you can think about it like an olive tree. When an olive tree is cut off, it has a really big root system. But way over here in the distance, there's a root and it has a little shoot that pops up and starts growing. And the tree will reestablish itself on the existing root system. And that's called a netzer, a branch. And that's why the city was called Nazareth. It was an offshoot. <laughs> from Jerusalem. And so that's why the Messiah would be called, he was the branch. But yet he's born in Bethlehem. Two prophecies fulfilled. Score. All right. Now, looking at more, it says that he has no form or comeliness that we should see him. There's no beauty in him that we should desire him. Now, the next slide. This is our view of the Messiah, according to the artists. We got the next, there we go. No beauty? I mean, come on. A guy from the Middle East with blue eyes? <laughs> Do we really think this is the image of our Messiah? I mean, the one who claims, who, the one who calms the storm, he has perfect hair? I mean, it seems like there was a hurricane, his hair might get messed up, right? But, but he has glowing, perfect, and barely tanned skin for a guy who is dwelling in the wilderness for 40 days with no food or water to drink. But yet he's Fabio-like. Seriously? And the one on the bottom right, he even has a pink robe, and I zoomed in on his hands. He has gold-painted fingernails. Is this really the Messiah? I mean, come on. He was a tough outdoor minister. He was in the, out in the wilderness. He was picking food with his hands and eating it on the Sabbath. A carpenter, yes. He's not Fabio the model, okay? This is why... Our brother Judah has a hard time saying, well, how come you call him the Messiah? He doesn't look like the Messiah at all. Our Messiah is a tough warrior. Most guys in the military that are tough warriors don't look like that. <laughs> I can promise you. They have haircuts like Matthew for one thing. <laughs> so it's cool. So anyway, it says he has no beauty. So this is how we think of him now. I mean, how many people had the, that picture on the far upper right on your mantle? Okay. He has no beauty. That's not our Messiah. All right. Now, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we did not esteem him. And so I have this gentleman saying, it's like, it's like I can't look at that. It's, it's, it makes my stomach hurt to see him on that cross, because it says that I can count my bones. In Psalm 22, he was beaten so bad that his skin was literally ripped and he could see his bones. His, joint, his, his shoulders were out of joint. They had pierced him. I mean, if you saw somebody actually get a nail put through their body and you had to watch it, how, could you do that? Would you cringe? Would you be like, mm. see, we can't look at him. It's, it's too much. It's too gut-wrenching. It's, it's too horrific. It's too, what would that feel like if it happened to me? That doesn't happen to a nation. It happens to a man. And so, can we hide our faces from ourselves if this is about a nation? 
Do we despise and not esteem, not esteem ourselves? I mean, Manasseh was the one that killed the prophet because he said, we got unclean lips. My lips ain't unclean. You're going down. I mean, it's an attitude. I'm the head, not the tail. I don't think there's a self-esteem problem here. But they say, we did not esteem him. They esteemed themselves, but not him. That's because he's not the nation. He's the Messiah, the servant. Does this make sense? So continuing on uh, in group three, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we have seen him stricken, smitten by Elohim, and afflicted. And again, can a nation bear its own sorrows? Can a nation bear its own? And considering that we were stricken by Elohim and somehow that helps us, it, it, it makes no sense. But it, it, it was when we have grief, when I see people grieving about a murder of, of a, a relative. He is our comforter. He understands. John the Baptist, he loved John the Baptist who was beheaded for just confronting a, a wicked king saying, look, you killed your brother so that you could have his wife. What is up with that? You can't do that. And he was like, I'm the king. Off with your head at a birthday party. Right? Do you think Yeshua, it says Yeshua wept when he saw that Lazarus had died. How many of us have had close relatives, people that we loved? His name, Lazarus, Eleazar, Eleazar means my Elohim is my helper. Well, Yeshua was crying because he was like, Elohim's here, I'm ready to help you. Yeshua, I mean, uh, Lazarus, come up out of there. And everybody was looking at him, he stinketh, according to King Jimmy. The body stinketh. He was dead for three days. It's impossible for him to come back. But yet, Lazarus came back because Elohim helped him out of that grave when he called out to him, this is your Messiah. But he's familiar with the sorrow associated with that, and he carried that for us. No nation carries that kind of thing for us or anybody. And it says, He was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the word iniquities is lawlessness. Torahlessness. How long in our lives have we lived in saying that the Torah is a strange thing? How, how patient and merciful is our Elohim that He would wait and give us time? I mean, I, I could have been squashed like a bug very early on in my life and at numerous points in my life. And the older I got, the more painful and more heavy those sins were because you could do a lot more when you're older and free from your parents they can they can constrain your sin a little bit but once you're free you're wild you can do it your own way right but it was because of that because the lord loved us so much that he gave us one that would actually uh, be crushed and bruised for my iniquities may i never add to that and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. How can a nation heal itself by its own stripes? It makes no sense. But if he is the one who is the Redeemer, he was striped, he took the punishment that was due to us. It says, we've all like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way, and Yahweh has laid on him, and literally the Hebrew says, in him, the iniquity of Saul, he had to carry it in his bosom like that red heifer had to put the hyssop and the scarlet and the cedar inside of it. And they lit it and the thing took it. It was the iniquity, our iniquity that was put in him and he had to burn it up and consume it in his death. But if a nation's gone on its own way, then how can it carry the iniquity to redeem itself? It makes no sense. There's, this is not talking about a nation. This is talking about one who would pay the price to spare the nation. And so it's talking about this imagery that we see here is in the Passover. This, this bread that we see is called uh, the bread of affliction, the matzah. And I've told you all before, my, my acquaintance, Shaul, Messianic Jewish guy from Israel, he says, uh, it's called the matzah. It's a higlu for big cracker. <laughs> and uh, it has no leaven. It's pierced all the way through. This bread is afflicted. You notice how it has like little tracks that look like it's burned. It's got burn marks on it. It's fragile. It's easily broken. And it says, by his stripes, we are healed. 
and he was bruised for our iniquities. So even the Jewish brothers and sisters we have, when they celebrate Chag Hamatzot, the festival of the big cracker, right? They, they're looking at a picture of the suffering servant spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. It's him. The words describe the cracker in their hand. Group four, got two more to go. Are y'all having fun? Is, it, is, this, is this making sense? Is it helping distrib- like to, to rightfully divide the scripture and understand how it applies? That's what I'm hoping. And so again, he was oppressed and he was afflicted and he, did, he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Again, there's more Passover imagery. When Yeshua was being tried first by the Sanhedrin, when they amassed this, this little midnight court session, right? And then they woke up the Romans and they were sending him back and forth. I think if you count it, he was actually tried six times that night. And six is the number of man. And it was 666. It was man's system that nailed him to that cross. But he was examined, I believe, six times if you go and look at the account. And when they tried to t- get him to testify to defend himself, He didn't say anything. He didn't try to defend himself because he knew his mission. He knew that the Lord loved all of you and me, thankfully, so much that this was what had to be done. This is the plan. This is the one and only process that Yahweh, the creator of the universe, would use to pull us into covenant with him again. It had to go down this way. It was his plan. It's a good plan, even though it's shameful on us. It's how it is. It shows how much he loves us. It cost him. And so, it says he was taken from prison and from judgment. Again, he was, he was locked away. They were sending him. They arrested him in the, the garden that night. And it says that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. So let me ask you this. Has the nation of Israel or the nation of Judah been cut off from the land of the living? They exist. And they're going to exist as a huge, wonderful kingdom. So they were never cut off from the land of living entirely. There's always been She'erit, the remnant. (laughs) The remnant of Israel. So again, a nation can't be cut off for its own transgressions and, and from the land of the living. And it says that it was a transgression of my people. If we consider ourselves His people, it's our transgressions that did it. And that's why he had to pay the price, the servant that Isaiah is talking about. And so in verse 9, it says, They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Now, and he was numbered uh, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And again, Yeshua, when he was actually killed, Nicodemus, who was In the New Testament, he was the teacher of Israel. And if you see the the series, The Chosen, they do a pretty good job showing you this guy was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. He was very uh, well respected. And he he is a very important uh, figure in society. And it was him with Joseph of Arimathea that came and they took the body. They asked for Pilate. They said, can we get the body? We need to bury him. And so... While, while they made his, his grave with the wicked, he was, he was cut off because he was crucified with two thieves beside him, right? So he was numbered with the transgressor. But when he was buried, he was buried with the rich. Well, this was a brand new tomb in Jerusalem. How much do you think it would cost if we wanted to be buried in Jerusalem today? <laughs> I think if we all took up our money, we might could put the down payment on it. It's very expensive. And so Yeshua was buried in an honorable way because our Heavenly Father has an amazing way of honoring the accomplishments of His Son and those that honor Him. Because if you think about it, <clears throat> these guys were in Jerusalem to celebrate Hag Hamatzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This was on Passover, and, and they died. And, or, I'm sorry, Yeshua died, and they touched His body. So you, because of the law concerning uh, human corpse contamination, they had to be baptized with the ashes of the red heifer on the third and the seventh day, which means that they couldn't even be clean until the Passover week was over. So they were disqualified from celebrating the Feast of the Lord. But I think this is what our Heavenly Father did. 
He knew that this was the plan long ago. And he instituted Pesach Sheni, the second Passover. He says, if you want to honor my son, I'm going to honor you. You can come back next month and you can celebrate. And I think if it was for no other thing than those two people who are faithful to his son against all odds, he gave us. And it's the only, it's the only feast, it's the only thing that we actually have a do-over. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It's all about Yeshua. And this is how our king honors him. And Isaiah was telling us all about it 700 years in advance. And it says that he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, right? Again, when Yeshua was in the garden that night, the New Testament records that there was a guy named Malchus, and he was the servant of the high priest. And Peter said, cut his ear off. And Yeshua healed his ear. He says, no, it's not going down like that, Pete. You know, so he, even after they arrested him, and even though Yeshua, he, how, how can he be filled with violence yet he's healing the oppressors against him. He's more concerned about their ear than he is about him dying here in about 12 hours from this point, okay? And so, so he had no violence, and, and, and there was no deceit in his mouth. He only spoke the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So again, if an entire nation, can they be buried with the rich? <laughs> I mean, it's expensive graveyard. You know, if the nation had done no violence or had spoken with any deceit, then why would Yahweh allow such terrible judgment on a nation? We've never seen this kind of a judgment on a nation. It's not talking about a nation. It's talking about the servant. And so the last group, Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, it pleased Yahweh to bruise him and he has put him to grief. And so when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and prolong his days. And the pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. So I want to talk about this, this Hebrew word, this sin offering. It's called the Asham. And, um, and again, Yahweh has allowed Yeshua to be crushed as it went, made a way for the new covenant. That's why it pleased him, because we had been divorced from Yahweh because of our unfaithfulness to him. And as long as the husband is alive and we're divorced, any activity that we have makes us a harlot. But when the husband dies, the marriage is over. And therefore, the, the woman, the bride, can no longer be subject to the constraints of that marriage, and so she's no longer considered an adulteress. And now she's free to return. And this is the gospel of the kingdom. This is the amazing thing that Yeshua did for us, because He broke that curse off of us so that we could come back. And the path has been established for us to remarry it, but this is a path that we have to choose. We're invited, but we have to choose. So I encourage you to make the right choice for the Lord. But it says he shall see his seed. Well, that seed is us because we're the seed of the woman. We are, we are, if we're in covenant with him, we are his seed. We are his children. He will see us. And, and then it says that his days will be prolonged. Well, when your days are prolonged, his days were cut short then, but when he was resurrected and his days are prolonged, that speaks of eternal life. And so we see the resurrection of our Messiah. His days will be prolonged according to the prophet Isaiah. And so he will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And it says, by, knowledge, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. And so if it's by his knowledge, and Adam knew Eve and bore a son, this is experiential knowledge. This is, this is not knowing about him. It's having an intimate relationship with him. And that knowledge is through that knowledge of him that the servant will justify many. Well, I heard this really cool pastor in Texas. He says, what does it mean to be justified? He was like, I guess it's justified and never sinned, <laughs> you know? So to be justified means to be made right in his sight. And that's what he does uh, for us. And he will, again, justify it and bear our iniquities. And so, verse 12, it says he's going to divide him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. When he divides the spoil, the loot, the plunder. This is speaking of the destruction of Antichrist's kingdom and establishing his kingdom on the earth, and he will be made great in that day. And so when we're looking at this Asham, I just wanted to go a little bit farther with this so you'll see something really cool. 
Now, this, the law concerning the Asham, this trespass offering or this guilt offering, is described in Leviticus 5, verses 1 through 13. Now, this particular, there's five different types of offerings. You know, you have the Olah, the, which is the, the burnt offering, the Shalamin, the peace offering, the Asham, the guilt offering. You have the Mincha, which is the grain offering. And uh, what was the other one? Somebody help me. Anyway, there's the fifth one. It'll come to me in a second. <laughs> Let's say again. I, I couldn't hear it. Anyway. Oh, and the Chatat, the sin offering. <laughs> so there's the Asham and there's the Chatat. It, it, it took a second. So uh, again, this Asham was required for three reasons the Torah points out. It says if you refuse to give true testimony, like you witnessed an event, and, but you refuse to give your testimony, if you touch an unclean thing or been exposed to human uncleanness, or if you've made a rash or unthoughtful oath or vow. So these are the things that if, if this happens, then the person, they become aware of it, then they are required to confess it. And then they also have to bring either a female lamb or a goat, or if two turtle doves, if they're poor. So I got pictures of turtle doves up there, right? And only an ephah flower if they're really poor, right? It's like, can you at least just give me a piece of bread, <laughs> right? I mean, he's like, you got to do something because you guys are, are guilty here. And so what we see is without confessing, our transgression, repenting and then trusting in the one who actually has given himself to be the Asham, we don't have atonement. Because that's the result. Because when, when you offer the Asham, you get atonement. Yeshua is the Asham. The one, the servant that Isaiah is talking about, gives us atonement. Now here's what's really cool. On the next slide, I look at this Hebrew word, Asham. And the Aleph speaks to Elohim, or some would say God, and Shem is name. So the Asham is the one who bears the name of Elohim. Now, what's really interesting in John chapter 19, it talks about this sign that Pontius Pilate affixed over Yeshua when he was dead. It was making an announcement about this guy. And it says, And he bearing his cross went out to a place, the place they call the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Yeshua in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title or a sign and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And it says, many of the Jews read this title for the place where Yeshua was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So there's no mistaking it, right? Anybody who would see this, that king wanted them to know, what is this sign saying? And the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but he said, I'm the king of the Jews. <laughs> and so he was very concerned about changing this. But Pilate, he washed his hand and said, this blood is not on me. He looks over and says, what I've written, I've written. So the pagan king was like, I've had enough of this. You're not going to tell me what to do anymore. <laughs> right? What I've written, I've written. So let's take a look at what was written. And I've translated it into Hebrew, but I gave you one so you can pronounce it. So you can see it would in Hebrew it would have been Yeshua Hanatzeret, the one from Nazareth, the branch. <laughs> Wamelech, he's an king, Ha Yehudim of the Jews. This was what the sign would have said. Now there's a Jewish practice that looks at the first letter of every word and to look at deeper meanings and patterns. And so what we see is the Asham that bears the name of Elohim, Yod, He, Vav. Hey, he was bearing the name of Yahweh above his head on the sign. Okay, he's the Asham. He's the servant of Yahweh. And yet we see Yahweh's name is above his head. He submitted to the will of his heavenly father. And so can you see why the religious leader would want to say, wait a minute, just say he said it. Because now if you can insert a couple of other letters, it no longer says Yahweh. It says something else. But Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And so we see then in Isaiah, this is saying this prophecy. And again, Isaiah was prophesying primarily to Judah. He's telling them concerning Yeshua 700 years before. He was born to Joseph and Miriam in Bethlehem during the fall appointed times of Yahweh, likely in 3 BC. And so I hope this message reaches your heart and encourages you to seek your answer to the question, who do you say that I am? So may you be strengthened in the faith of the one who paid it all to have the legal right for you to come back into covenant with Yahweh. And may he find faith on the earth, especially in you, when he returns. 
He's coming soon. And so that's the core message for today. Now, there's one thing I wanted to make mention of. I'm getting a plug here for Pastor Matthew. You might be proud of me on this one. So if we go to the next one. Rosh Chodesh Yulol is about a week away. And that's when it begins a six-week countdown to the fall feast and again into Yom Kippur. And the tradition in this congregation is to do some form of fasting during this period to help us prepare for the fall feast, which are all about the coming of the king. And so Matthew, I'm sure, is going to share more about this with the congregation when he wants to, to do that. He's just getting back in town. But Isaiah also speaks of this acceptable fast in chapter 58. And so it's very good to consider these things as we prepare to fast. And so I'm just going to give you a summary so we don't have to read the whole chapter together. But, I, but again, he's rebuking Israel, Judah, whoever he's talking to, for these things. When they're fasting, supposedly says they're finding pleasure. They're exploiting their workers, or another way of saying it is driving them really hard. They're getting as much as they can out of it, right? And then they're fasting for strife and debate because if you're trying to get information from the Lord, well, how are you going to use it? To love your neighbor? No, I'm going to win an argument. Well, he's like, well, how about you win a brother, <laughs> right? And it's the same thing. They fast to strike with the fist of wickedness. And then with religious pretense and thinking it's going to get favor from Yahweh, he's like, he's rebuking us for those things and that attitude. But he says, what's pleasing to me when you're fasting? What did we just sing about earlier? Loosing the bonds of wickedness. He's breaking every yoke, right? Undo the heavy burdens. Set the oppressed free. Break every yoke. Feed the hungry. House the poor who are outcast. Clothe the naked. And he also says, there's no hiding. So he says, don't, can you hide from your own flesh? Meaning, your own flesh is your brothers and sisters. Oops, there they come. I better hide. I don't want to share with them. <laughs> I'm not available right now. <laughs> he says, don't be doing that. Don't be having that attitude. You're, stand there. And remove the finger pointing and the wicked speech. You know, that's that judgmental, that harsh credit. You do those things. Now check out this next slide. This is the results when we fast in this way. He says, first of all, your light is going to dawn in the darkness because there's dark. If, if all the people have that that nasty attitude and stuff. But when we when we behave the way he's saying, suddenly the darkness now has a light. And when this light comes, your healing will spring forth. How many of us need a healing? If we start fasting the way he says to fast, maybe his promise that your healing will spring forth will happen. He says, Yahweh will be your rear guard and he'll respond to your call. When we say, we never hear from him. We don't know if he's listening to me. Well, he says, if you fast this way, whenever you say, you call out to me, I'm going to say, here I am. What you need? This is what he promises. Read it. You can read it for yourself. I'm just summarizing, right? And your darkness, what you consider darkness, is actually going to be as bright as the noonday sun. Now, that's not very dark. <laughs> it's pretty light. But that's as bad as it's going to be for you because Yahweh is helping you, which he says he will also guide you continually. How many of us want the Lord's guidance continually? I do. I need his guidance all the time. And he says, when we fast this way, he will guide us continually. He will satisfy our soul in the drought. Have you ever, has your soul ever felt thirsty and dry? But when we fast that way, he's going to satisfy us. He's going to strengthen our bones. Do we feel like we have weak bones? Or, you know, is our heart sick? Do we, do we have osteo, spiritual osteoporosis? <laughs> you know, He's strengthening our bones so we can stand for His kingdom. And we'll be fruitful, He says, like a garden and be blessed. Well, what's the point of a garden? We've got all this food out there so it can be a blessing. He blesses to be a blessing. And when we fast that way, He'll make sure we get more because He knows that it's going to provide an abundant harvest. And he goes, and then, this is where it gets really interesting. Those from among you will rebuild the old waste places. How many of you guys want to participate in the second exodus? How many of you guys want to be like Ezra and Nehemiah? Yeshua the priest and Zerubbabel who rebuilt the temple, starting with the wall and the foundations. Because he says you're going to raise up the foundations. With that attitude and fasting and caring and concern and loving for our own brothers and sisters, He's like, okay, come on home. You've been faithful with that little stuff? I'm going to show you something you can really be faithful with. And then he finds, he says, then you're going to be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. And so, so when you consider those things, 
I'm not saying don't fast from food or from whatever else that the Lord may put on your heart because there's something to that. When we, as Joshua Hooford was telling me the other day, he said, you got to tell that, that flesh man to sit down. Your spirit man's got to be stronger. And you have to make that flesh man submit. So Joshua's a good count, accountability partner on this. So I'm going to be calling him a lot. I'm hungry. <laughs> so anyway, thank you and Shabbat Shalom.